I asked her what I needed to tell you about her because she doesn't regularly come here. And most of you may not even know who she is. Cindy was, some time ago, a youth leader for the Washington Conference. And I heard about her, but I never met her because I was in Upper Columbia Conference. <laughs> and then she moved to the General Conference to be at the White Estate as one of the associate leader people there. I don't know all the, all the names they put on people. And so she was there until she finally decided that uh, she'd worked hard enough, it was time to relax and, and retire. But I just heard someone else to say this morning that pastors don't retire. They get retreaded. They get reworked. And... Uh, they're always available. <laughs> and I guess she was available for pastors to call to, to check with her and say, can you come preach at Moses Lake on the first Sabbath of October? And uh, she's here today. Thank you, Cindy, for being here. Thank you for what you have been doing over the years in Washington Conference and at the General Conference. And uh, we're glad to have you now here at Upper Columbia for a for at least this day. So, the scripture reading. Come near to me. Listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. Now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit who leads you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand and your offspring like, the, like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed from my presence. And God bless that. Cindy, we prayed before, but come on up here and we'll pray before you begin. our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Cindy to be here today to share your word with us. We thank you that you have given us so much. You've given us so much uh, teaching and instruction, things that we need to learn and live with and allow to be part of our lives. Thank you for Cindy who has uh, given her life to young people and to church people and to the service of your church. Bless her today as she shares your word with us. With us, May it be your message for us today. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You're on, lady. Good morning, everyone. I am very happy to be here at Moses Lake. I was telling our retired pastor here that it's been about 60 years, I think, uh, since I was here. But I actually have ties to this area. Um, my parents were ranchers living near Harrington, outside of Ritzville, uh, for many years. And there were, at that time, no Seventh-day Adventists in Adams County. So my mother came back from a dance at the Grange Hall one Saturday night and fell on her knees and said, God, is this all there is to life? We work hard all week. We go to the dance. I dance with other men. My husband gets jealous. Uh, we drink too much. I throw up in the toilet. Is there nothing else to living? And the next morning, the song, Lift Up the Trumpet and Loud Let It Ring, came on the radio. And the, the voice of HMS Richards saying, if you would like to know more about the Bible, send in your name to Box 55, Los Angeles, California. There were no zip codes back in the day. 
And my mother actually filled out all those Bible lessons. And then a Bible worker came out from Spokane named Viola Brooks. And she studied a little bit more with my mother. And she said, Jean, would you like to be baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist? And my mother said, I can't. I smoke two packs of cigarettes every day. And the lady said, well, we'll pray. And they did. And as she left, as she drove away from our ranch, my mother reached for a cigarette, and she heard a distinct and audible voice, which she never heard before and never heard after, that said, Jean, don't. And she never smoked another cigarette. She was baptized the next week in Spokane. My father was a member of the German, German Congregational Lutheran Church, um, but he didn't attend anymore, uh, not since he had been a young person. And the neighbors, of course, were all just completely incredulous that my mother could join this cult as they thought it was and she wasn't playing cards with them anymore and she wasn't going to the dances anymore and she, my mother who was the life of the party uh, didn't seem to be the life of the party anymore at least those kinds of parties and so they told my dad do something about that and so when when Sonny Lou and Bill Loveless uh, so that dates me as being much older than most of you here did their first evangelistic series in Sprague um, my dad went along with my mother so that he could prove her wrong. And as he was satisfied that she had not joined a cult, um, he thought, it's all good. She can do what she wants to. The flowers are getting t better taken care of than they were before anyway. And then uh, Sunny Lou and Bill Loveless came out to the wheat field where my dad was on a tractor. And Bill Loveless said, Adolf. That was my dad's name before World War II and after. He said, what, what are you going to do about what you've heard in these meetings? And my dad said, oh, nothing. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just satisfied that my wife didn't join a cult. And Bill Loveless said, would you like to give your heart to Jesus and be baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist? And my dad said, I'll have to think about it. And he told me several times afterwards that after Bill Loveless left, he actually got off the tractor, knelt down in the field and said, God, is this your voice calling me? And he was baptized. And they remained loyal Seventh-day Adventists all their life. My dad just died over here in Yakima three years ago uh, at the age of 101. My mother died at the age of 87. Uh, some of you had my dad as your men's dean there at Pacific Union College. Um, but the, some of the stalwart members of the Ritzville Church included uh, Dr. Smick and the Fisher family, who some of you old timers know, the Fisher family from Washtuckna and had been part of this church, I understand, for a while. And we used to come out to Moses Lake to the potholes with them to go uh, boating and, and, and swimming. So, you know, Moses Lake, I drive by it every time I go to Ritzville or Spokane. But I just see the sign. So I hadn't actually driven in, and I can't believe how it's changed since I was 10 years old, how, how big it is. And um, yeah, I'm just delighted to see you in this beautiful chapel that, that somebody's taken a lot of work to make beautiful for God's house. And then to hear the news that it won't be long until you're in your own sanctuary across the way. That's something to give God glory for. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, um, the story of my mother and father finding Jesus as Savior. But I have another story for you. 55 years ago, on a beautiful fall day like today, I was curled up in a fetal position under a bush in a re remote, sparsely populated municipal park in the Tyrolean Alps of Austria. Life seemed pretty dismal, my personal problems insurmountable. I was about 5,000 miles from home, uh, just learning a language, absolutely no money to leave. So under a bush seemed about as good a place as any to contemplate life on an overdose of thyroid pills. Until a passerby 
stopped and stooped and said with total German matter-of-factness, Was machen Sie da? Sind Sie okay? What are you doing there? Are you okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, I stammered and I st jumped out from under my bush and brushed the dirt and the, the twigs from my clothes. Ich bin fine. But I wasn't fine. And I really didn't know what to do about it. I went to church all right, prayed some, occasionally even read my Bible. But these spasmodic efforts to know God didn't really seem essential to my well-being or to the comfort and healing of my aching heart. I stumbled painfully through life for the next three years. My husband and I had returned to the United States from Austria and we were both teaching at Laurelwood Academy when the rescue from my abyss of doubt and despair took place. This is how it happened. One Wednesday night, I just felt an overwhelming need to know God, to really know him. Who is he actually? Can he help me with life? Can I trust him with my heart pain, with my emotional wounds, my anxiety, my despair? Leaving our toddler, who's now a judge in Yakima, with my husband, I walked through the darkness to our church where I found a handful of elderly people, at least they seemed elderly at the time, although I suppose most of them were younger than I am now. They were studying the book Steps to Christ, available in a simpler version called Steps to Jesus. I knew about that book, of course, but I had never read it. Somewhere in the course of reading that book from cover to cover over the next week, Something clicked. I rediscovered the Jesus of my childhood. The Jesus I had pledged to serve with all my heart in my baptismal vows. The Jesus I had kind of kept at arm's length. The Jesus of the cross, my cross. The Jesus of the resurrection and the life. All that suffering, all that dying, all that loving for me. And I have to say, from that day until this, I've found Jesus daily in his word. The great I am word, the incarnate Jesus word. The antidote to my despair, the solution to life's perplexities and conflicting claims. The guidebook on how we can live with joy, not just forever, by and by, which we look forward to, but starting right now, today. That word centers on the cross. The creator of the universe, the one who made everything, everyone, the one who understands my inner conflicts and my temptations and my sadness, shrank down, took upon himself humanity and bore in himself the punishment for our sins, for my sins. I finally got it. I finally internalized it. I cling to this word, sometimes like a drowning person. I cling to it because it's the revealer of Emmanuel, not just God with us, but God with Cindy. A lot of people, especially young Christians, have doubts about the Bible. There's some things in the Bible that we can't explain, and Satan uses those things to try to shake our faith. But God doesn't expect us to believe without evidence. He's given us plenty of reasons to believe in him to believe his character, to believe his word, but he's also left some room for doubt. Our faith should be based on evidence, not proof. We can't prove it. We were not there at creation. We were not there at the cross. We can't replicate those events, but there's plenty of evidence to support our faith. It's impossible for us to fully understand God or his ways. Even the smartest people don't fully understand God. The Bible says in Job chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. Let's try it this way. Yeah. Oh, the depths. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? 
They are deeper than hell. What can you know? And the Apostle Paul also said, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So in other words, it's just just so much. We can't take it all in. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. So even the Apostle Paul, maybe the greatest theologian of all time, outside of our Lord and Savior, even if he says some of God's ways are unsearchable, we have to acknowledge that we can't understand everything. But we can still know that God is good. We can still know that God is loving. We can know that he's merciful. We can know that he's forgiving. We can see that he loves us because he sent his son Jesus to die for us. So the Bible is full of mysteries, but that doesn't mean the Bible is not true. There's also a lot of things in the natural world, in nature, that we can't explain. We don't know it all, but we don't doubt the existence of the natural world because we don't understand every single thing about it. So why should we doubt the Bible just because we don't understand everything in it? I think the truth is that a lot of people doubt the Bible because they don't want to follow its teachings. The Bible tells us to turn away from sin and follow Jesus. But a lot of people don't want to do that. They want to keep on living their own lives, their own way. So they make excuses to doubt the Bible. They say it's full of errors. It's full of contradictions. But that's not true. The Bible is the most relatable. It's the most reliable book ever written. It's been tested and proven over thousands of years. So if you are doubting or questioning the Bible, don't let that keep you from believing. Ask God to help you understand his word to make it real to you. Ask him to give you the strength to follow his teachings. So here's some tips. So first of all, as we mentioned, pray about those doubts. Pray about them. Bring them to God. Ask God to help you understand his word. Ask him to give you faith. Remember the uh, epileptic father? And Jesus asked him if he believed. Do you believe I can heal your son? And what was his answer? Yeah, I believe. But Lord, help my unbelief. We can pray that. We can say, Lord, I believe. I have some faith. Give me more. I want more. And second, read your Bible regularly, not just spasmodically. My problem with with not finding the reality of Jesus that was going to sustain me through my everyday life was I didn't read the Bible regularly, just sometimes. But you'd starve to death if you did that with food, right? If you only ate sometimes. And it's the same way with our relationship with God. Read read the Bible regularly. Unfortunately, stats from the Department of Ministry at the General Conference tell us that a lot of Seventh-day Adventists don't read their Bible regularly. But we can be people of the Word, and we can get the fullness that God wants to give us in this relationship. So it makes a difference to us that it's not just a matter of ritual. Ask God to send his Spirit into your mind and heart. And underline the promises that you find in the Scriptures. Put them on your phone so when you're standing in line at the store, you don't have to endlessly scroll on your phone, but you can put these beautiful promises into your mind. I put the promises on a little key ring, and I carry, I carry them with me many places. Um, the more you read the Word of God, the more you'll understand it. And when you memorize these promises, they'll come into your mind at just the moment that you need it, just at the moment when you're down or discouraged or challenged. And express words of faith and hope, not words of doubt. When you express hope and faith, hope and faith grows. But when you express doubt, doubt grows. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask your pastor, ask your elder, ask your Sabbath school teacher. There's so many resources out there for us to know God in better and deeper ways. But pick those resources carefully. Make sure that you're asking people or or reading things that are written by those who believe that the Bible is the word of God. All of it. Not part of it. All of it. Remember, doubt is a normal emotion in a world where Satan claims to have usurped ownership, Satan is going to try to introduce doubt into your mind every chance he can. He's going to try to keep you from believing. Resist him. Resist him. Don't let 
doubt keep you from believing that God is real and the Bible is his word. Get down on your knees. Tell God all your struggles. Just open your heart to him. Let him have it. He wants to hear it. He wants to hear from you. He's waiting to hear from you. He loves you like there was not another person in all the world to share his heart. Even the strongest Christians have doubted at some point. I want you to think about one of the greatest of the prophets, Elijah. We're going to look at his story in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel what Elijah had done and that he had slaughtered the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the gods strike me and even kill me by this time tomorrow if I have not killed you just like you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. What? What had just happened to him? He'd had that showdown on Mount Carmel, inviting everyone to come up and see who is stronger, those Baal gods or the God of heaven. All day long, the Baal prophets had asked their gods to consume their sacrifice, even trying to sneak in a few firebrands since nothing was happening. At the end of the day, Elijah called the people to him. He built this great altar out of stone, dug a moat around it, laid the wood on it, laid the sacrifice on it, and then asked the people to fill up four huge old barrels of water and dump it over the sacrifice so they would know that he wasn't sneaking in a firebrand somewhere. Then they asked, he asked them to do it again. And then a third time until the water now not only soaked up the wood, and the sacrifice that filled that little moat, that little trench that was around the great altar. And then Elijah prayed. And fire immediately came from heaven and consumed the whole shebang, including the stones, including the water, licked up the water. And what does the Bible say? Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Even after that had happened. He had gone and asked God to send rain. Now, this time God didn't do it immediately. God, Elijah had to pray seven times before a deluge came on a country that had had no rain for three and a half years, not even due. Pretty remarkable. And yet, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And they went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. I'm at verse 6. He looked around, and there beside him, his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up, Elijah, eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, he ate, he drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 nights and days to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. 
When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down their altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, nothing like changing the subject on the Lord's part, right? Anoint Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abba, Mehola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. And yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who've never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. So Elijah went. He found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and, there was, and, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him, threw his cloak across his shoulders, and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I'll go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I've done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So what can we learn from this story about what to do about doubt, depression, fear, and anxiety? Elijah had reached a point of desperation, burned out, exhausted, challenged by obstacles, without a vision for the future. He ran into the desert alone, scared, scared of Jezebel, failing to trust God. But God had not abandoned Elijah at all. In fact, God was working through this life experience to enable Elijah to hear his voice. God was preparing him to trust God in deeper ways. Have you ever had a life experience where you could look back and say, yeah, God was preparing me through that experience to go through something even bigger, a larger challenge, and then to hear his voice of comfort and instruction and wisdom through his word? Did you notice back in the story that God asked Elijah the same question twice? What are you doing here, Elijah? Why do you think that God seemed to ignore Elijah's answer both times? Have you ever been in a situation where you heard God's voice say to you, what are you doing here? I think was God, God was asking me as I was, as I was lying there, you know, discouraged and alone under that bush in Tyrol, Cindy, what are you doing here? Don't you remember that I told you, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I will never leave you nor forsake you, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. I think that God had an interesting antidote for Elijah's depression and doubt. He told him to return to Israel and work with others to bring about a reformation. What might that look like for us today? What needs to be reformed? Is something in our life that needs to be reformed? Something in our church? Something in our family? Something in our nation? Could we come together and pray that God would reveal what needs to be reformed and what he wants us to do about it? The second part of God's antidote for Elijah's depression was God put Elisha in community. 
He sent him a friend, Elisha, with whom to engage in kingdom work. Do you have a friend with whom you can pray? Do you have somebody that you pray with? Somebody that you can pray about with the, about the challenges in your life and in their life? And God commissioned Elijah to mentor Elisha. Who are you mentoring at this time? Who are you encouraging to find hope in the word of God? To be faithful to him at all costs. You might say, I'm too young to be a mentor. Oh, no. Jeremiah 1.7 tells us that that's what Jeremiah said to God. I'm too young. Can't give a Bible study. Can't share my faith. And God said, oh, no, you're not too young. Go, and I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what to say. God is looking for us to have some holy boldness for him. And then his spirit anoints us, helps us to know what to say. We can all, every one of us here in the house of God, speak words of hope and faith and courage. And that's so important because some people doubt, they're skeptical of God's word because they don't want to follow it. The Bible and its restrictions are not popular, you know, with people who love to sin. They don't want to obey God's rules, so they make up excuses to doubt the Bible. This is especially true today in our valueless society. So your life your example, your words, your faithful love and encouragement could help someone who's struggling with doubt because they see in you the beauty of holiness and they long for it themselves. They see in you that you found something to be joyful about, that you're not whining anymore, you're not complaining anymore, you're not expressing words of doubt anymore, but words of faith in the Lord Jesus. If you want to know the truth, you have to be willing to obey it. Jesus said, let me catch up with myself here. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak just on my own. So if you have this heart change that God has given you, a heart change to seek after God, to know him more, he will reveal truth to you especially when you're struggling with what is truth. So instead of arguing and questioning about things you don't understand, obey what you do know. The Bible says in Acts 5.32, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. So when we act on what we know, then the Lord gives us more information to understand more fully the things that we've had questions about. By God's grace, do everything you know you should do, and then you'll be able to understand and do the things that you're a little unsure of now. And there's one type of evidence that's available to all of us, regardless of our education level or our experience. God invites us to prove for, our, for ourselves that he's true. The reality of his word is true. His promises are true. He tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you are overcome with doubt and anxiety, look back and remember how the Lord has led you in the past. What did he do for you five years ago, five weeks ago, ten years ago? Write those things down. Type them into your computer. Put them into a journal. Whatever you need to do so you don't forget them and read them often. Recall them often. Remember his goodness. Remember how God took care of you at that time when you weren't sure what to do. God ran interference for you at that time when everything seemed so challenging. Instead of relying on what somebody else says, you can experience God's word for yourself. You can test his promises for yourself. He says, ask and it will be given to you. His promises will be fulfilled for you. Let's see if I can get this to go to the next one. I don't think so. There we go. Okay. His promises have never failed. So often we, we think of his promises for long ago and far away, for the people for whom they were written in the first place, and we have a really hard time saying, but that would, would that apply to me? 
But we honor God most when we trust him most. We honor God most when we believe that those promises were written not only for the people to whom they were directed thousands of years ago, but also to us upon whom the ends of the world have come. So as we draw near to Jesus and as we experience the fullness of his love, our doubt and our darkness will disappear in the light of his presence. It is inevitable. I speak from experience. When we invite Jesus into our lives and we spend time with him, he dispels the darkness. Doesn't mean we will never have challenges again. Oh, no. But he walks with us through those valleys and we sense his presence because he's promised to be with us to the ends of the world. The Apostle Paul says that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. We would say today from depression, from angst. He's brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves, Colossians 1.13. Everyone who's passed from life to death spiritually is able to testify that God is true. They can say, I needed help and I found it in Jesus. He met all my needs. He satisfied the hunger of my soul. The, now the Bible is to me the revelation of Jesus. I find him there. I, I, I find what he's like. I find how he loves. Why do you believe in Jesus. I believe he is real. I believe that he's a wonderful heavenly savior because I have found this word to be the voice of God to my soul. We can have this witness within us that the Bible is true, that Christ is the son of God. We know that we're not following cleverly devised tales. Peter exhorts his brothers and sisters to grow. Don't just say the same. Don't just say stagnant. Grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we grow through the word of God, through the spirit speaking to our hearts and us responding to it. When God's people are growing in grace, they're going to get a more clear understanding continually of his word. They're going to experience the sacred truths of the Bible. And it's going to be transformative. It's going to be life changing. It's, we're going to find new relevance, new meaning, new beauty in the word of God that we have not seen before. And that this has been true ever since the inception of the church, and it will continue to be true until the end. The path of the righteous, let me see if I can get that up here for you. Yep. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter until full, the full light of day. And when does the full light of day come? It's when Jesus comes. So we should every day be growing. We mustn't be satisfied with a stagnant experience. By faith, we can look to the future. We can grasp God's promise of growth, growth in intellect even, and in understanding and in love and in kindness and forgiveness. Our human mind will unite with God's mind. Wrap your mind around that reality. Our human mind will unite with the mind of God and will be brought into direct contact with Jesus. Jesus is the source of light. He's going to give us gladness. He's going to give us comfort. And everything that has confused us about God's providences and the events of our lives will one day be made plain. We might not understand it all here. Some of you have had heartaches that are very deep. And we might not be able to tell you just exactly why that happened. But God will one day. One day the things that are hard for us to understand now will be explained. That's a faith thing. And where human minds can only see confusion, maybe even broken promises, then on that day we're going to see the most beautiful and perfect harmony. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see, but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Like it's kind of obscure. Back in those days they didn't have very good mirrors. But then we'll see face to face. Now I just know in part, just have a little bit of knowledge. But then I'll know fully, even as I am fully known. When Elijah said to God, Lord, I just want to die, God gave him the strength to live. Depression is real. But so is God. Anxiety and doubt are real. But so is hope. To wait patiently to trust when everything looks dark is the re reason for our life. It's the lesson we all have to learn because nothing is more invincible 
than the soul that feels its own weakness, feels its own helplessness, feel its own need of something outside myself. If I rely wholly on God, God will make me invincible in his strength, through his power, under his instruction, by the Holy Spirit. Doubt, fear, and anxiety are normal human emotions. We all experience them from time to time. But when these emotions become overwhelming, they can make it difficult to live a happy and fulfilling life. And I want to add a little caveat here. Sometimes there is a need of intervention by a medical professional. If the situational depression hangs on for more than a month or if it's impairing the normal functions of daily life, counseling, therapy, medical help, those might be needed by those who've had a highly traumatizing events in the past or a genetic disposition to worry and anxiety or a serotonin imbalance or have had parents or caretakers um, who modeled a dysfunctional response to stress years ago. But even if we are under a physician's care for our fears and our trauma and, and our anxiety, there is a heavenly physician who longs for us to know him better and, and trust him more. The Bible tells us that God is not afraid of our doubt. He's not afraid of our anxiety, our fears. He knows that we are human. And he understands that we're going to occasionally feel these emotions. We're going to occasionally feel like Elijah, pretty down. But the Bible tells us in this story and many others that we don't have to let these doubts, these fears, these anxieties overwhelm us, overcome us, control us. We can overcome them. We can step beyond them. We can step out of them through faith in God and his promises. We can choose to trust God. We can choose to express words of hope and faith and encouragement to our friends. You know, we all know that our world is changing rapidly, very rapidly. The season of distress and trouble that's just before us as the people of God will call for a faith that does not falter, a faith that does not give up. My prayer for us is that we'll let our roots go down deep into the word of God. We must, because only those who have fortified their minds with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. We must believe that the promises of scripture are for us. When God says, I will never leave you, I will never fail you, it's really true. He will never leave us, he will never forsake us. That we all can call out to him, Lord, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you more. I want a deeper experience with Jesus. And Alden and Louise are going to lead us now in this song of this heart cry, Lord, I want to know you more. By his grace, may that be true for each of us. We didn't quite make getting words on the screen, but I know you know this song because I started searching and I've known it since, oh my goodness, 2000-ish. So um, we're singing the chorus only and we're going to ask for an introduction from Florence and then we'll sing it once and then invite you to sing it the next time. Oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you. To feel your heart and know your mind. 
look within your eyes, stirs up within me. Cries and say, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you more. Does it ring familiar? No? Well, let's try. And um, I stumbled on the words, and I even had it in front of me. So let's try it again. Let, we might sing it several times here. Oh, because I it is our you. prayer. Oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you, to feel your heart and know your mind. Looking in your eyes, I within me. Christ that faith I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you. I need some help here. So I'm just going to come down here and sit by Andrea. And we're going to sing and we're going to invite you to share the words. Okay, you know yeah. this girl. Here's another copy, by the way. <laughs> she knows it. <laughs> oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you, to feel your heart and know your mind. Looking in your eyes stirs up within me, cries that say, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you more. Isn't that beautiful? Can we do it one more time? I'm getting more confident here. Oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you. To feel your heart and know your mind. Looking in your eyes stirs up within me. I want to know you. Oh, I want to know you more. As we pray. Father, that is the cry of our hearts. Lord, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Amen. And you've given us that privilege, Jesus. You long for us to gain greater intimacy, greater fellowship, communion, friendship, understanding with the God of the universe. And we can choose to do that, Jesus. So I ask that this week, um, that nothing will prevent us from getting into your word spending that time waiting on you to answer and listening for that voice to share the mysteries of heaven with us. It is our great privilege to come into this kind of at one with Jesus. So may we take advantage of what you extend to us, I pray, Lord, beginning right now. In the mighty and powerful name of our Savior, Jesus, amen.